Hey everyone, this is Erica Lucas, your host and founding member of VEST, an organization connecting women across industries, regions, and career levels, so that together we can expedite the pipeline of more women in positions of power and influence. Welcome to another episode of the Vester Podcast, where we explore the invisible barriers holding women back in the workplace and share stories of women building power collectively. In banking, there's prescribed leadership, like the people that are supposed to say, these are the issues of our industry. And so you have big associations that are like, these are our banking leaders, and they're the ones that can contribute to discussions. Well, um, I was excluded from this group and told, you will never be welcome in this group, never. And um, the guy that was communicating that to me, he was telling me what everybody was saying and that I was not being told directly. And his great advice to me was, Make it so that if your voice isn't there, Jill, that everyone's like, this is not a legitimate table. This is not a legitimate, we have not included Jill's voice and it's clearly lacking. And so that advice to me was so good in helping me create my own voice because we're not going to get access to certain rooms and tables. And and if sometimes if we are there, it's just to fill a number like, oh, here's our one, one, one woman, here's our one minority, and you're you're a placeholder and you can fill it even though you're still you know, engaging and having a voice that, um, that being like, and it's, some people call it as like personal branding, which I hate, which <laughs> we just were talking about this Erica, but, um, cause it's not a crunk tribe, like brand or image. You're like, this is the only way I can say my voice because you're not going to listen to me otherwise. In this episode, we talk about career transitions, navigating workspaces, and the challenges of getting to and staying in the C-suite in a male-dominated industry. Join us as we talk to Jill Castilla, President and CEO of Citizens Bank of Edmond. Jill is a nationally recognized innovator in banking and financial technology. She currently serves on the 12-member Federal Advisory Council for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, representing the 10th Federal Reserve District. Jill is also a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army. In addition, Jill chairs the Southwest Graduate School of Banking at SMU and is on the board of the Community Bankers Association of Oklahoma and the board of trustees at Hawaii Pacific University. This episode is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of audiobooks, podcasts, guided wellness programs, and more. So if you're looking for a book on how to level up at work or any other subject, Audible has over 1,000 titles for you to choose from. Head over to www.audibletrial.com forward slash vest her and get a 30-day free trial plus a free credit to use on the book of your choice. To access our guest's full bio and for show notes, go to www.vesther.co forward slash podcast. This recording was part of a more intimate coaching session with best members and has been repurposed to accommodate this episode. Did you ever think that you would be the CEO and chair of one of only 14 women-owned banks? Yeah, no. I mean, I grew up um, with a single dad, um, economically um, disadvantaged in eastern Oklahoma and Altmulgee. Um, no prospects really to go to college or encouragement to do that. Um, I ended up enlisted in, in the army when I was 19, um, hoping to have a pathway to go to college. I had carried groceries out, um, our local grocery store at Homeland, uh, for a woman who was a chairwoman, of, a chairwoman of our local community bank. And she paid for me to take the ACT. She would ask me like, when are you getting out of town? Um, what college are you going to? I mean, she's always pushed me every time I carry groceries up for So I really had this very idolized view of the community banker. Um, I'd never seen this a wonderful life, but it was kind of that same embodiment of kind of a, a George Bailey um, kind of figure. And so when I enlisted, um, went to basic training, um, got actually um, was involved in a um, situation that resulted in a court martial, not in me, but of other people I was a witness. So I ended up having to stay in training longer 
Then I thought um, all of my money was direct deposit at Citizens Bank of Edmond and a family member spent all that money while I was gone. And um, I didn't know um, that forgery, I could just go to the bank and get my money back. Um, I planned to go to OSU and it saved about 15,000, I thought, but had nothing. Kind of deferred again and went to school, found a school that gave me a full ride um, in South Texas and Kingsville. Had to basically take rides to Kingsville to get there, met my husband. Um, was the very first person I met in the ROTC department. Um, we ended up getting married. Um, he got stationed in Hawaii, finished my degree in Hawaii. Um, I was chemical engineering that whole time, was my major for four years, and then um, went to Hawaii and really um, started working for a t-shirt company called Crazy Shirts. And um, my boss there said, I think you're better at business than you give yourself credit for. And so um, she encouraged me to go to a local university to see if... Um, I could transfer there. So I got a finance degree. I took 33 hours a semester while I worked full time and finished my degree in a year uh, while I walked across the stage eight and a half months pregnant <laughs> and then came back to work at Citizens. And when we moved back to Oklahoma as a um, just a bookkeeper, making minimum wage, applied and got a job at the Federal Reserve. Um, and their management development program was at the Fed for about 10 years. They paid for me to get my master's. And then they sent me to banking school, which was a bad mistake on their part, because then you pretend run a bank. And I just totally fell in love with banking. And um, and I really thought about this embodiment of um, Lurleen Mabry, with, who was the, the matriarch of Mabry Bank now. Uh, that wasn't their name back then. And I wanted to be like her. And so one of my Classmates recruited me to go to this bank in Northern Minnesota as the CFO type of role. And then the bank here, my mom married into the family that owns part of Citizens. Um, Citizens is owned primarily by an employee stock ownership program, which is why we're women owned. Um, the majority of our team has ownership in the bank that has, and they're majority women. Um, but the bank was in trouble. It was the worst performing bank in Oklahoma. Banks are rated one through five on camels. And I can't legally tell you like where we were, but we were at the very bottom. <laughs> so we were about to close. And so then I came into the role kind of as a CFO type of role, led that turnaround and then moved into the CEO role. I've got three kids, I'm married still to Marcus. He still fits up with me. Um, and that, that's kind of the story. So um, kind of came full circle with the army. Um, I left um, when we moved to Hawaii. and. Um, and then came back to it in this volunteer role with the secretary. Why are there only 14 women-owned banks? Yeah, I'm, it's crazy um, that we actually were approached by the Fed last year to see if um, they thought that we'd probably qualify for the designation. And so we applied for it and, and we received that designation. But I think... Um, I mean, you look around banking. When I worked at the Fed, there was like great gender representation. You were expected to have a diverse table. There was no different in voices and who was at the table. It was just such a, it, the Army was different from that back then, but the Fed was not. Banking, if you look at, um, yeah, I mean, Erica and how I've had a lot of these, these discussions around the table, you see mostly white men. And so I think it's, not surprising that you see less than 2% of uh, banks have women in the C-suite, not as CEOs, but in the C-suite, less than 2% is the number. And so when you think about ownership, it makes sense that that correlates. Um, you know, even with us, it's not a, a woman, that one woman that's like owning the bank, which you would typically see in some of the other um, other private institutions is through the employee stock ownership plan. So it's kind of of the people uh, rather than um, having um, a female leader. I think it, an industry that doesn't seem welcoming to women at the highest levels probably doesn't attract people to lead those types of organizations. Women-owned banks too, for whatever reason, and it's the same with minority-owned institutions, they typically don't grow very fast. They're, um, they don't receive capital. I mean, we have a lot of the same, um, there's a lot of same parallels as you see in the startup community, um, that it's difficult to get capital. You do have easier, supposedly, access to capital, but for some reason, it's a lot more difficult to get. And so um, you can't really scale. So I think that they get targeted to with acquisitions maybe before they're able to mature. How does all this that we're talking about and like, like the lack of capital go into women-owned banks and the lack of women in, in C-suites and across the board in finance, how did that show up for you as you transition into the industry and how is that showing up for you as, as one of the few uh, CEOs and, and chairs of a, of a bank? Yeah, like the first institution I went to, um, I mean, I got a know your place discussion. I never have had that kind of a 
know your place. Um, there was, I was new to a community and brought my family to a rural community in, in Minnesota that we know, didn't know anyone except for the owner of the bank. And so getting involved, I got a call, I got called in and said, Hey, you're being a little too out there, a little too visible. People are starting to wonder who actually runs the bank. You need to kind of know that you're, that's not your place. Um, and I'm like, I, I really don't understand what are we talking about? And they're like, no, you need to have a lower profile. You need to just do your job well, and we you need to let others shine. And it was apparent that it, it wasn't the other women that I was letting shine. So, um, you know, that was, I, I think, the first kind of hard conversation where I was like, wow, I, I've always been encouraged to explore and get engaged. And now I'm being told to suppress some of that. And um, and then when I came to Citizens, um, it was a difficult situation. It was 100% led by men. And um, and they were exposed from a vulnerability, I think, um, because there were some really bad decisions being made. And then you had this woman making these types of assertions um, that caused some problems, honestly, uh, for them personally. And um, and there was a lot of um, you know words used that I had never had thrown at me before. And um, and then I was also getting feedback along the way, even when I moved into the CEO role about you're just not very likable or approachable, or you seem um, distant and cold. Um, but then you would get like another feedback that like, wow, you're, you seem very emotional, you know, even when I get a little firm. And so you're, you're getting all these signals where it's like, okay, I, this guy's over here crying. Like I'm definitely not emotional. Like, what are we talking about? Um, but it would seem like just the hyper criticism um, no matter where you were. And, and then also just the, co- the the conversations about being too young to do something versus, you know, being next to a, a guy that's 10 years younger than me that is not being told that he's too young to do something. You know, at 37, that's pretty mature when I came here versus, you know, having people in their 20s that are being told that they should be at that same level. So um, I think that, you know, I, some of it, I think, is culturally within our industry that has that I've seen it show up. And then I think culturally, too, sometimes um, being in a more Southern environment, um, that that can that can kind of make it where there's a little difference in, in how it shows up. For sure. How did how did you get through and how do you still get do you, by the way, do you as as a CEO now and chair, do you still experience some of that feedback and microaggression? And, and if you do, how do you, how do you stay above it? Well, you ask these questions, Erica, and you know the answers. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I definitely do. I think what's changed is you have to find um, allies, I guess is the best word. Um, it changed on my board whenever I was able to, my executive coach actually moved onto my board and he's a very traditional masculine figure that had some preconceptions about me that just weren't okay and and, or we're just right but then like for five years we developed a strong trusting relationship and he's now on my board of directors and man he can really identify some things is much more sensitive honestly to think to some discussions than I am where I'm a little bit more like well I don't think that was because I'm a woman or and he's like no it's exactly for that reason and so having someone like that has helped immensely but before that you know finding women that are experiencing the same situations or similar situations that you are, and that you're able to give you courage in those times where you're feeling vulnerable. Um, you know, Erica is a great example of that. But you, the fortunate thing is, you're not experiencing usually those those really times of difficulty at the same time. So you can, and if you do, then you go drink together. <laughs> but if it's, uh, um, but if you, but usually they're there. They're they're having a period of strength whenever you're having a period of vulnerability, and I think that helps a lot. Whenever you feel isolated and alone, that's where um, that can become very treacherous. And I was there was a period of time at the beginning that was like that. So finding a so your people and then getting some allies place is exceptionally important. Yeah, and and the importance of having a coach, right? Like somebody that keeps you accountable and all of that. Super yeah. Bad. And I love having a coach that really views the world much differently than I do. I mean, he, um, he'll, he'll tell me like, you need to, that's a, he gave me an example of one time. He's like, you know, I had that situation occur in a staff meeting once and I just picked up and threw a chair. <laughs> like, wow. If any of us threw a chair, like that's not appropriate behavior, but there would be, you know, I think of Amy Klobuchar, I think that was through, through a binder or something, you know, and there was like Wall Street Journal articles written about, about it. And, you know, we can't, 
we can't show any kind of aggression. Um, and so he was like, okay, maybe I'll slam your hand on the table. I'm like, you can do that. I cannot slam my hand on the table. Even if it's the most effective thing in the world for you, it's something that I can't do. And so to have someone that I'm also shaping his view of kind of how I have to interact with the world, but then also like to hear like, this is how an aggressive man would have handled the situation is also good to navigate and understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something uh, that's very true when Chris and uh, Chris and I uh, still to this day are very independent in our relationship and how we work and everything. But there was a time where we were even more so, right? I was doing my own thing, in my own industry, and he was doing his own thing. And then when we started working together, and, and and we would come home and he would, you know, share about his experience in the workplace. And I would come home and experience, and, uh, you know, uh, talk about my experience in the workplace. And I don't think that he, uh, you know, because he'll say, oh, that's not true. I always believed you. And I know that he believed me, but I think he he didn't know to what extent until we started working together. Hmm. We started going to the same meetings. And now I have to like, if we're, especially if we're sitting next to each other, I have to like grab his leg to say, calm down (laughs) because he, he, he never seen it firsthand or he never paid attention. He probably saw it, but didn't internalize it or didn't see how it affects women that he cares about, you know, and he, then he, his connotation and, and his uh, way of thinking and his way of even participating in meetings or in conversation completely changed after we after he got to experience for firsthand what I was talking about yeah so thanks for sharing that yeah Jill I'm so excited of what you do and um, I mean the, being in banking um, and being a woman and have uh, the position that you have in power I mean it's just it's difficult but Erica asked how you do it right now, how you keeping it right now. And I think that I'm just going to add, it's not a question, but I'm going to add it, um, that right now at least it's easier because there is like a name and you can you have a diagnostic that you can call it the imposter syndrome, syndrome or um, like, you know, you, we fight for um, um, equal opportunities and it's up there. Um, back in the days when I was in banking, you know, 15 years ago, that wasn't such a thing that you can call it the imposter syndrome. So when you have people, which I identify with the comments that you just said, it's just like in, in a whole week, uh, you know, I was called condescending, but then emotional, and then uh, too aggressive or too quiet. So I'm like, well, you cannot be all those four things in a week, but I think it was a way to you to take you down. It's just, I'm going to do whatever it takes for you not to say anything and just be quiet. Um, so um, I do identify with, and, and I I see uh, the picture of you, uh, you're tiny, I'm tiny. And one of the things that the microaggression is that when you're in a room full of men and they stand up and you're like super tiny right next to a super tall guy or a big guy, it's even the microaggression is there because you feel like, you know, let's just sit down because we're all the same high when we're sitting down. It's just like those minor things, we don't even see it. And it, and it happens a lot on banking um, and not even mention the way how they have suits and tied. And sometimes you just want to wear a dress and a jean jacket and then you can't because you need to give a statement. So anyway, I, yeah. I just wanted to identify that. But it, the time is better right now, hopefully. It is, but it hasn't changed too much. And and it depends on what crowd you're in. Um, there's more professional crowds and there's some that are still very insulated and are not as welcoming. So, and it, the, you think you're, you think, wow, we're past it. And then suddenly you're confronted with it. It's funny in meetings. So uh, making space for yourself, I think is so important, especially when you're small. And I like sitting down too, because then you can raise the, the seat to make sure you're the same height as everybody. And whenever I start feeling, and I think we've, this is just a natural tendency for anybody when you start feeling that imposter syndrome or that I'm not in the right place or people start making you feel less than what you are, that you're not qualified to be there. You physically start getting smaller. And so I'll, it, you know, it's a good trigger for me to be able to, okay, okay, now I'm going to be like, you know, making a lot of space and encroaching kind of the space of others and, and just making myself a lot bigger in this space standpoint, just to, and it's amazing what that kind of does like 
Um, the, the, I love that book presence where she talks about like the hormonal reaction to when you're taking up space and when you're making yourself bigger. And so um, that's a trigger for me to say, okay, now it's time to be the big girl in the room. <laughs> let's, let's bring it. And it happened to me last week. I was with a bunch of large banks, um, all men, but I had this really cool experience. There was a lady there that she's an overall of us cyber and she's a decorated war hero. And she had these cool tattoos on her arm and a nose ring and a senior senior official in the White House. And then her chief of staff was there, also a combat veteran. So you had three women in the room, all veterans, none of the guys were. And so all we were doing was talking about the army. <laughs> and so it was like this super cool. And I could see this totally badass woman just totally owning this room, basically saying, Oh yeah, here we are, the three that is served. Oh, well, did anyone else serve in the room? Oh no. And not not to shame anybody for that, but it was just, I've never been in a room where there you had these three women that were so powerful that it made other people feel uncomfortable. I love that. I love that story. I would have loved to be in that room. And Leanne mentioned something that I believe oftentimes can be a misconception that the higher you go the more, the easier it becomes to be in male dominated places or to have a voice or or to, or to have the opportunity. And you and I have had several conversations about this because um, sometimes it's harder, the higher you go to be outspoken and to take on issues because you actually have even more scrutiny uh, coming from everywhere, whether it's internal, external, multiple stakeholders, what has been your experience? Um, so yeah, and I'll hit it from a couple of different angles. Uh, one is, um, so like in banking, there's prescribed leadership, like the people that are supposed to say, these are the issues of our industry. And so you have big associations that are like, these are our banking leaders, and they're the ones that could contribute to discussions. Well, uh, I was excluded from this group and told you will never be welcome in this group. Never. And um, the guy that was communicating that to me, he was telling me what everybody was saying and that I was not being told directly. And his great advice to me was make it so that if your voice isn't there, Jill, that everyone's like, this is not a legitimate table. This is not a legitimate. We have not included Jill's voice and it's clearly lacking. And so that advice to me was so good in helping me create my own voice because we're not going to get access to certain rooms and tables. And, and if sometimes if we are there, it's just to fill a number like, oh, here's our war one, one, one woman, here's our one minority. And you're, you're a placeholder and you can fill it, even though you're still you know, engaging and having a voice that, um, that being like, and some people call it as like personal branding, which I hate, which we just were talking about this, Erica, but, um, cause it's not a crank tribe, like brand or image. You're like, this is the only way I can say my voice because you're not going to listen to me otherwise. And so you have to be very thoughtful about what you're contributing to because you're so discredited so easily. So you have to be insanely competent, more so than what you're just talking in a room. If you're out there talking publicly, you have to be insanely competent about it, above reproach, relentless in that communication. And you just have to, you have to feel something so confidently. So I'll have, I tweet a lot, but I will delete more tweets than I tweet because I'm like, I really don't, I'm not an expert in this. I want to contribute to the discussion, but I'm not an expert in it. So I'll let someone else have that. Um, if I, if I have a friend that's getting, you know, at that's getting exposed, I'll jump in, but yeah, I try to be really thoughtful about being precise in my voice and being relentless with it. Like, I'm not just going to talk about this one thing one time, like it's going to be over and over and over again. Um, my 90% of my communication is very positive. And then, so the negative has to be a small percentage of that where it starts getting crowded out quickly. I think that'll change for women over time as we get more voices. And, and I love social media because I think it's more receptive to voice that's more agnostic and, and like what gender is speaking. No one's really paying as much attention is set locally. <laughs> I think that's where, you know, Eric and I probably have similar experiences where, I mean, I've been called into high level officials offices based upon liking a tweet that I thought was benign, 
but also spoke to my heart. And, um, and I was like, I'm not going to unlike that tweet. Um, so, um, because my, I had a friend that was hurting and they tweeted that and I wanted them to know that I saw them. Um, and so there's, it's amazing who all's watching you. Um, that official's not on any social media, but had a printout of my tweet and my like on there. So not my tweet, but someone else's. Um, and then, then you're also able to have like this tribe of people too out there. Cause the person that did tweet that, when I told them that they're like, oh, we will burn this down. Like if you, I've got your back. And so I think finding your own voice, your very authentic, genuine voice is so important. And if it's not being welcomed at a table or in a room or in an industry, then you find the outlet and when it, you can make be impactful. Um, there's a very good question on the chat that I want to address because I think it's so true. And we're actually seeing it. If you ask me, we're actually seeing it right now with Elon Musk just announced that he hired a new CEO. It's a woman, trouble company, hire a woman to come fix it. Uh, so this is tied to what Sue is saying on the uh, chat. Uh, Sue, do you want to unmute yourself or do you want me to ask it for you? Uh, sure. So I have heard that women more... Uh, more often are offered prominent positions with troubled companies. And we could probably all think of some examples. And it sounds like that was maybe your experience when you came back. And so how did you navigate that? And what's your take on that situation or how you would navigate it in the future? Yeah, no, I have, I love this question and it's so true. And at the same time, I was kind of going through this. They had, what was the latest name? Marissa Meyer, is that? For that was the Yahoo um, CEO. She was like, oh, she overlapped me during this time. So I was like, so inspired by her. And they just like destroyed, <laughs> destroyed her. But um, so I came in and I was assistant treasurer. I came in, it was a 50% pay cut. It had no positional power and everyone hated me. But I only came, I was only able to get hired because my stepfather was really emphatic on wanting me to come because he was worried about the, the sale of the bank. Then I found all this fraud within 30 days that included him and other senior management. So they all had to leave. And so then now you're left with leading without the positional authority to do so, but you're just taking charge. And um, I've never been like more scared in my life, but also felt really prepared to be able to just be able to be very decisive. And which I think is what from a you know, women, we, we've been trained as moms or sisters and caregivers to, to be able to handle so many different things while we're doing work. And so I think that's why we're able to handle under stress a lot more um, complicated issues that require tough decision-making. Um, but I will say, so I was in this role and then became the CFO. We hired a, a we hired a, a CEO to help us during this time period. He kind of focused on the outside and I focused on the inside. So whenever time came to say, okay, the bank has recovered, we don't need two people leading. And um, I said I was going to leave um, the organization. And I thought I thought I couldn't recover from a reputational standpoint because literally everyone hated me and and um they have worked out of that, but there was, I didn't trust them and they didn't trust me in return. Um, but um, they, the board said that they wanted me to run the bank and they offered me the CEO role, but I want to, I, I think it's um, a bird just ran into my window, poor guy. <laughs> um, but I got declined twice to be the, the leader of the bank by the regulators. I have like the most extensive resume, was a regulator, like they kept saying that I was too young. And I like, I think if you put Joe versus Jill on there um, on my resume, that it would have been a different piece because there was other people in this role that were much younger um, and that, that and there just weren't any women that you could see. And so because we were rated a certain way, we had to get approval. And so the board was emphatic. And so once we received a rating in which we didn't have to get regular report approval, they put me in the role. And so now, then I had this like, feeling of inadequacy, honestly, that I had a group that was like wanting to tell them, I told them so, told them so that this is not someone that we would choose to run this organization. And then internally, I had the distrust of the team. And it was really hard. And I think a lot of women face that where you're trying to prove legitimacy and cre credibility. And then in a turnaround, you're being, you're removing yourself emotionally, maybe more so than a guy maybe would, because you're trying to be objective and really make good decisions. Um, and 
that's where I got a lot of feedback about approachability, coldness. Uh, I wore black all the time and they'd say like, you look like an undertaker and you have that persona. So I like literally Googled how to look more approachable and it was to wear colors. So for like five years, I wore colors every single day and suddenly, you know, board members were like, wow, you're so much more approachable now. So um, I think that we just, it's so complicated for us. And then when you do the turnaround, it's an opportunity for women because they're not desirable jobs to be able to achieve higher levels of um, leadership. But then it's, and we're equipped, I think, very well to be successful in those roles. But I think that also then plays into a lot of stereotypes and can have hyper criticism that you hardly have any examples of those that have sustained past the turnaround. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Monica, you have a question? Yeah, Jill, thanks for being here today. I had a question. Um, the, the topic of this conversation particularly caught my attention because I'm in the middle of a career um, transition right now as well. And one of the one of the things that I am um, struggling with and would like some in, in feedback from you is, you know, we're told um, and we've heard even from some of our best speakers, like own your mistakes, right? Own the failures um, and move on and move beyond them. I would just like to know, um, kind of in your in your position, in your um, in the, in a position to hire people at C suite level or or director level or um, kind of more senior level positions. What is your preferred way for people to do that? What's an effective way to do that? To oh, you may be coming from a position, for example, where you may not have been as successful as you wanted to be, or it didn't exactly turn out the way you want, and now you're moving on, how do you frame that for your next role in, in talking to the decision makers? Um, what's the best way to do that um, without, I, I don't know, not without, I'm just gonna ask the question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great question. It's a question every single one of our interviews is to tell us about one of your biggest failures. And, um, I've had one case where someone's like, I've never felt been a failure. I've never failed at anything, never failed. I mean, I was going to hire this person. It was like the last question asked. And it was like, okay, no way I'm hiring this person. Um, I think the way to handle like communicating where I've seen that best communicating failures or mistakes. And I, I prefer review, 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 I refer to my own as failures um, because especially as entrepreneurs, I mean, that you can't be completely risk averse. You've got to be able to assess risk. And so um, whenever someone's able to say, you know, this is, I did this, um, this is how I assess the risk and I misjudged or this, I didn't take this into account. This is what the result is. And this is why I learned from it. Um, I, I think it works really well. How we, um, you know, this is going to be all Brene Brown on you, but you know, the way that we connect with one another is showing vulnerability. And one of the best ways we can show vulnerability is saying this is a mistake I made or a failure that I encountered. And this is how I bounced back from it. Um, it's took me a really long time to share a store, my story at the bank. And in the community, I would say like in the bank, I was hated, but in the community, maybe hated worse because the senior leadership of our bank was beloved. And so in certain crowds like the chamber, they were revered. And so when I would go to events, people would refuse even to shake my hand. Well, I was named a woman of the year with, with Edmund Chamber. That wasn't supposed to be a humble brag or anything, but with, with the woman of the year, you have to speak in front of the chamber. And I share the story of our bank without ever having done that before. And there was a line of like 40 people afterwards, people were crying in the crowds and the, the, there was a shift. You could feel it. I'm still getting like goosebumps about it. Like that day, that moment, everything changed for me. And it wasn't because people were like captivated by a story. It's that they felt connected, that I wasn't cold anymore. I was someone that they saw their, they saw their own failures in me and how they recovered from them. And it was just really beautiful. And it becomes addictive then just to be able to just like, okay, I screwed that up, but look, it turned into this. And so I think being really transparent with your um, failures and mistakes, as long as you're still competent, like if you're like, okay, I'm, I run, I'm trying to be a professional driver and I run every red light. I cannot not run a red light. Like it can't be something that erodes like your ability to do your, the job or what you want to do with your business. But, um, but sharing um, how you failed and how you overcome it is it just so important and connects you with other people and and will will escalate your people's opinion of you um, in ways that no resume could ever. 
Yeah, I think um, just as a follow up to that, I think I'm kind of in this position and there may be other people on the call where we're kind of in this middle position of kind of being senior leadership. And um, I personally, I'm an attorney, but trying to like move to that next level. And I feel like a lot of my relevant experience has been in a situation that maybe wasn't necessarily like the most cultivating to like grow talent. And so it's like, in some way, I feel like I'm going to new potential employers with like, here is the things that went wrong, but here's everything that I learned. And I promise I'm bringing those lessons to this role. Right. And it's like, as the person that's hiring you, like how much confidence does that inspire? I mean, they might connect with you being vulnerable, but it's like, oh my gosh, I feel like I still haven't had the opportunity to really shine and grow in a, in a role that is supported enough to be able to do that. You know what I mean? And so again, with age and those sort of things all working against you, not you, but, um, someone like me too, it's like, uh, you know, just doing that in a way that is, um, vulnerable, I guess, like, like you said, is probably the most effective and just being honest about it. And, you know, Hey, here's, here's what I bring to the table and what I have to offer. And, um, I guess hopefully they see that and give you a chance. <laughs> yeah. And I would stay away, um, just because it can get a little dicey if it's, if the mistake, um, or failure is an interpersonal skill type of situation. It seems like people that sticks with people as being more negative. Yeah. So if you're using like a mistake or failure, I would use more of one, more of a decision-making and kind of like a one that you had a learning growth experience rather than something that could potentially be perceived as like, um, an interpersonal conflict, um, yeah. because somebody might see themselves in the other person's shoes. So just that would be the only, but I think, um, I, yeah, I, and I'm happy to talk offline about this too, because I think, um, you need to learn more about specifically what you're going through. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for being here today. I know that you made a, a career transition early on going into finance, but have you ever considered leaving finance or transitioning uh, careers? Um, and if so, what has stopped you to this point? Yeah, so I've had two, I've had a lot of opportunities to consider other things, but only two things came up that were really profound that caused me to like, okay, I need to really consider. And for me, it, you know, I think you have to look at where, where you get your joy at. And for me, it's making an impact. And that impact doesn't necessarily have to be like a national impact. It's do I, am I impacting positively people's lives and what I'm doing and would something else impact people more? Um, and so in both of those cases, what I'm doing now exceeds the impact that I can make, even though the compensation or power may be different in those different roles. Um, I did shift over with this volunteer role with a civilian aid. It's an unpaid job with the, the army. And that was super out of my comfort zone. I was a lower enlisted team member and it was very intimidating me to go and like now be working with generals and senior staff in the department of defense. And, um, but it's created so much opportunity in my role on the, in the finance side to see things um, even more broadly and more clearly and to put things in context, like I'm making decisions about, should we increase the IT budget or launch this new software when other people are making decisions about sending soldiers off to war or do I, do I make this equipment safer or is that too expensive um, to be able to save someone's life? And so, um, you know, you start putting, you're able, whenever you're able to move out and even experience another sector, you get a little bit more appreciation for the job that you get to do. Um, but I love when there's variability in career paths. I think that that's, you know, we should all have a growth mindset. And so whether that's having to change industries or the type of job that you're doing within an organization. We rotate people in our organization. So we have three people in our 55 team member bank that have been CFO. We've had three that have been the chief auditor. So I think having diverse skill sets and completely and growing that, even if you stay within the same organization or career path is really important um, to be able to then see questions and answers more fully as you move into executive roles. Thank you for sharing that, Jill. One of the crucial things that we have to do that sometimes is one of the most challenging, we, we actually did a LinkedIn poll and, and it was one of the ones that ranked the highest is, you know, sometimes we attach our identity so much to a role, to a project, to an organization that when we do decide to transition, it's hard for us to assess what skills are transferable or how do we transfer what we've currently learned and what we currently 
the skills that we currently have to to that new role. Um, I wonder if you've ever experienced that. And most importantly, I wonder if you've had to develop new skills to be in your current role, or perhaps most importantly, if you had to get rid of skills over time to be in the role that you currently serve. I probably should get rid of skills. I we um I was in this meeting last week and it was with these you know CEOs, the largest banks in the nation, and the top regulators in the nation. And what I'm providing some feedback on is like you really need to change this schedule on the call report, which is like the quarterly report that banks do publicly, and because that's really restricting your ability to look at data uh, more accurately. And they were all like, "Wait a second, how?" do you do this report? Like, no, I used to do this report and now I still kind of oversee this report and I really like this report. And it, um, for a gap in time, if I didn't continue to pursue it, it would look like I didn't have strategic management type of skills. And here I am talking with people that are very impactful. So I had to take like a skill that was very granular and be able to say like, this is why it's important to the nation that this little data point that you're not collecting needs to be collected. Um, so I think whenever you can stitch it together with like communication skills, like, okay, you can't just like randomly throw out that I know this little thing, but being able to stitch it to something more strategic and knowing the place. And that's where those diverse experiences allows you to do things like that more easily where someone who's maybe been in a C-suite in one industry and in one bank, their entire career, they can't see these little things. They're just getting information from people. And so I think one of the th- dangers as I think, I think it, I would hate to stereotype it as being a women do this mainly because I've known men that have as well is that we can kind of micromanage, um, not, not really people, but want to still know the details and feel like we need to be an expert in all the different functions that we lead rather than just being able to, I think, I've seen pure men do very effectively to be able to exit uh, from some of that granularity. But in times of crisis, that granularity is so important because you have the expertise that put it into context. Love that. Thank you for sharing. Mariana, uh, you just turned off your camera, but I know you had a question. So I want to give the mic over to you if you are still in a position to ask it. Hi, Jill. Hey, how are you? So good to see you. (laughs) Good to see you too. I think you kind of hit it. Um, And Erica, it was really timely because I was thinking with the great resignation, a lot of people not only left their workplace, but they left their industry. And so they are bringing new, you, you talked about competency. They're bringing new perspectives, competencies, and skills into their industry. What I have found is that there's almost this hierarchy, right? It's Yes, you have new thoughts and ideas, et cetera, and so forth, um, but we value this level of competency or skill set more. And so I'm just wondering, how do you navigate that? And you just said something that was really uh, profound of, you know, if you're bringing new ideas, you have to be able to stitch them together in a strategic way to make it applicable to the workplace. So you may have already hit it, but um, if you want to add any anything outside be willing no, to I, oh, no, I, I think it's, I think you're taking it from a little bit different perspective. And I appreciate that. Um, one of my faults as a, as a leader that I think that, um, my peers and maybe some other, um, uh, regulatory people, I would say could criticize about me is I like not having experts. Like I'm not going to go hire an expert in marketing from another bank to be a bank marketer at my bank. Like, I don't want to market like another bank does. I want someone outside the industry that's going to challenge me and then make me think outside the norms. And I like doing that a lot. And in some critical areas, you have to have that, that transference of, um, of expertise and perspective and experience at another institution, but for lots of areas, you don't, especially ones that require creativity or that an organization saying, I want to change and grow. And, and so if you come in and you bring someone like you in and it's like, okay, here's your guard wells, or, okay, we're not going to let you have an, your, what you're saying is not well uh, grounded and ex, you know, experienced, then, then, I think that's reflective of an organization that's not really wanting to grow. Um, I'm probably addicted on the other side where I love that kind of fresh perspective coming in, but it does expose you to risk. So you have to be a very engaged leader to be able to say, okay, 
and be able to communicate back to that, okay, man, that I don't think that's the greatest idea in the world, but you're onto something. So if we parlay that over here, is that, what do you think about that? And so when you're able to have the dialogue, that's like really like the creativity isn't just coming from one person, but that's truly innovation and collaboration whenever you're able to bring this perspective and then someone's able to use their experience and expertise to be able to then create something that neither one of you thought about individually, but wouldn't have been thought about at all if you weren't there. So um, it's an area of huge opportunity for my industry to be able to make sure that we're expanding our perspectives um, on so many things from a social standpoint, diversity inclusion, but also in the products that we offer and where does it, where, what does banking look like into the future? And that can be applied to all kinds of industries that we're kind of stuck in our ways. And so you have to have this influx of talent one thing I've also found in our industry is that it attracts individuals that want stability, that don't want change, that want a prescribed routine. And so then you're like, okay, now we're going to turn into an innovative organization. So y'all are going to be, you know, not be routine, not have a sense of complete safety. You know, there's a lot of things that you just culturally, it requires some infusion of other perspectives that are used to those types of environments, typically outside your industry they're able to allow you to become the organization you want to be. We live in an age where, again, platforms, social media platforms are being used to um, create awareness on the type of talents, on our thoughts regarding an industry or regarding leadership, whatever uh, is. And you've done extremely well, even before you became popular, right? Like you you, you had already, you're following your network on both on platforms like LinkedIn and, and Twitter. Um, what advice do you have for women that are trying, let's not call it building our personal brand, but what are you, what would you tell to women who are looking to leverage those platforms to become a thought leader in their industry or in the space they want to go into and, and tied to that, how have you leveraged those platforms to build an impressive network that you now have? Thanks. I mean, I've been out there for a long time. So I think that that's a huge piece of it. But um, I follow my I have a good friend, Scott Williams, and he um, he gave me great advice 10 plus years ago about Twitter um, to be genuine, to be accurate and to be positive. And I would say the positive for me is more respectful than positive. So um, I think you need to make sure you have a high degree of authenticity, the genuine aspect. So talk about things that you know that are truly your views. Um, and make sure that it is that you've got all the information that you have um, to be able to really ensure that that's the view that you that you have. The accurate piece of it, there wasn't as much disinformation whenever this little mantra was put in place, but now you have to be so careful with what you're resharing or who you're allowing into your orbit. Man, I love so much the mute feature in Twitter and you can do it also in um, LinkedIn and Facebook where you're like, I don't want to see posts like this. And so the, the person on the other side doesn't know that you basically have blocked their communications, but it's it's also being, I think, disciplined in what you're intaking. If it's just like, like Erica, I love Erica so much, but there's a lot of people she interacts with that I don't even see their tweets because I just like mute it and like they don't know there's no like they're not going to screenshot my block um and i and i get the joy of knowing that i don't li listen to your trolling you know views of different things that upset me and it makes my day better so um the accurate piece is really important especially in this age of disinformation and if you are resharing and i like to reshare um um people's thoughts i also um engage a lot on twitter with journalists this has been the most impactful thing that i have done and I'll do some of it, um, I mean, mainly if I'm sharing or if I have an additional perspective to add, or if I see like a quote, I'll pull the quote out and be like, wow, I really like this quote that's in this article and then tag the journalist. But my really, the development of relationships is having in the DMs where I'm like, hey, I think you missed this, or this was inaccurate, or is this what you meant to say about this piece? And I'll ask questions and I try to give you good, or I'll say, hey, I think I know another voice that would be, that really could help this story if you do something in the future. And it's never self-promotion, like, hey, anytime you want to talk to me, I'm available. It's, um, you know, my friend Erica would be great or this person. And so then you're making your network networked into someone else and you're giving someone else um, exposure. And then you're, and then when they do, then you're, you're retweeting that. And you're, you're also messaging Erica and say, hey, I put your name in for this, just so you're aware. Um, 
it's really, and I, to Erica's point previously, like when people are like, why are you out here on social media? Well, I don't feel comfortable going to a lot of these events. I'm an introvert. I'm managing a house and kids and, you know, people and customers. And I mean, it's a lot easier for me to have two screens and to be on social media and engaging there. So if you have the same type of like, um, um, rapport building that you do in person, then it will pay off in the long run. And so I always, I, try to tweet out 10 tweets a day, which is stupid high. If you need social media firm is going to tell you that that's too much. Um, but it you're not creating your own content. I'm not scheduling anything. It's just basically going out there for 10 minutes a day, retweeting some stuff, you know, putting some stuff out there if I feel like it, um, and then just moving on. Um, so I think being very consistent um, is also very important with the accuracy piece. And the positive just... Um, it used to be I was all sunshine and rainbows. I'm not as much that, um, but it's if I'm going to gripe about my Hertz car rental experience, I'm going to say, hey, Hertz, I need to send you a DM. Um, and then I'll send them the DM. So I just don't like kind of bitch out there, which is uh, about things that don't matter. But then whenever I'm mad, I will um, like, and I feel like I'm the one voice kind of have a narcissistic view that's like, okay, it's I'm called to respond to this. Then I really try to get my thoughts together and it may not be as positive, but it's going to be something that is accurate and that can be used as factually based and that has a strong voice from my unique perspective. What is one last call to action that you have for everybody that's here? Yeah, so this is my big advice. And um, and actually, Erica, is, is one of the ways that we kind of elevated our friendship was this situation. But um, I don't know if you guys remember Mitt Romney when he was running for president, and, um, and many of you are too young to even have that experience, but um, he talked about having like binders full of women that, oh, no, I can fill these roles because I have these binders full of women. He was really criticized for it. But I was in a situation not that long ago where I was asked to assist filling some senior roles. Um, and and I had to kind of real time come up with like a CPA, a lawyer, and, and I did not have women at the tip of my tongue for some of the roles that I could say, or a minority that I could say like this person and like, wow, I need to make sure that whenever I am asked that about, hey, I'm looking to fill a CFO role. Hey, if I'm looking, not that some, I always have to make sure that it's a woman that's being filled in role, but I need to make sure that there's women there included in the potential for that role. Um, you know, I need a healthcare CEO or whatever, like I need to have that in my head. And so I would challenge you all to do the same so we can get really focused on our own careers, but also be thinking about those women. They're absolutely exceptional in what they do. And there are names that you can bring for whenever you're asked. So it's, we talked about like making space for yourself. And so a lot of this too is about making space for others and making, you know, that's the only way we're going to really get more seats at the table is if we are the ones that are able to be the advocates and the allies for both women and um, for, um, for, I think, I'm from a minority or anybody that's not as underrepresented in a, in an industry or a different community. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and don't forget to leave us a review. And if you're ready to take your career to the next level, apply to join our community of professional women, all eager to help you get there and stay there. Go to www.besther.co and apply today.